thank you Advancement Courses for sponsoring today's show. Stay tuned at the end of the show to learn how to save 20% for online professional development. Restorative justice and consequences that actually improve behavior. Episode 473. The 10 Minute Teacher Podcast with Vicki Davis. Every weekday, you'll learn powerful, practical ways to be a more remarkable teacher today. Hacking school discipline, nine ways to create a culture of empathy and responsibility using restorative justice. We have the two authors of this book with us today, Brad Weinstein and Nathan Maynard, both who are from Indiana at Purdue Polytechnic High School Network. So let's start off with you, Nathan. Define restorative justice for us and why do we need it? So restorative justice is the practice of repairing the harm when there's harm caused. So the old technique for discipline is the carrot and stick method. The carrot and stick method is when you want a student to change a behavior, you give them some sort of incentive, which is the carrot, or you give them a stick to try to get them to do what you would need them to do, which could be any type of punishment or anything to try to change that behavior. What restorative justice does, it focuses on five different R's that we highlight in our book. The first one is respect. Then we hit relationships, responsibility, repairing the harm, and then reintegration into that classroom or back into that setting. Okay. So you also talk about a culture of empathy, Brad. How would you define that and why is it necessary? A culture of empathy is very important because kids aren't naturally born with this big empathetic, you know, characteristic. You see kids who will cause harm to other kids and not seem to care or not even realize how their actions are impacting others. So when we have a culture of empathy, we want to make sure that students and their social emotional skills are being taught explicitly in classrooms. And we want to make sure that when a student does something or has an action, he or she actually understands that I am impacting my teacher and my classmates and my learning environment when I do it. And not only am I impacting them, how is it making them feel and how am I going to make it right and kind of make up for it or repair the harm of what I caused? So once kids start to think about everything from another person's perspective, that's when they start to change their behaviors. And that's when they grow socially and emotionally. Whereas, you know, I'm going to make sure that I don't do this thing that's going to hurt others because I know what it feels like. And I don't want to make other people feel that way, too. And, you know, Brad, empathy just cannot be understated the importance. I mean, if you look at some of the worst, you know, sociopaths or criminals in history, Many of them had no empathy. They just could not comprehend the feelings of another person. Yeah, and we want to be very sure that we're not just teaching empathy when kids get in trouble. We use it when they get in trouble, too. But we want to make sure that these social and emotional skills are part of our everyday classroom. And, you know, we even find stories that we can talk about with characters and point out those social emotional skills as well. We also have classroom circles to start the classroom with where we can kind of build those skills. We can have each other talk. We can talk about how what I'm doing is affecting you. So basically, we make it kind of part of the school culture, not just something you do when you get into trouble. So, Nathan, give us an example of one of the suggestions in the book. So one of the suggestions in our book really highlights how to seek to understand behaviors. What we find is that every behavior is a form of communication, and there's normally something that is driving that behavior. So one of the methods that we use in our book is something called the iceberg method. What the iceberg method is, is a way for students to really unpack what's behind a behavior and what's sort of those other feelings that they've been dealing with. So could you give us an example of how this would work? Yeah. So let's say a student is in your classroom and they have an outburst. They get angry and let's say they start to cuss or get upset and they're removed from that setting. What the iceberg method does is it shows you that what's sticking out of the top of the water is the tip of that iceberg. And that's that anger. What's underneath that is any other emotions that the student may be facing. So let's say they've had some relationship problems they've been addressing. They've had some issues at home that day. Those are all things that are underneath that iceberg that us as teachers, we can't see that. All we can see is that tip of that iceberg, which is that that anger. Yes. And there is always something behind that sort of thing. Kids don't act out for no reason. I mean, there's always a reason. Uh, So Brad, you also have a way that you want to share. What's that? 
So when we have a student and we want to address them, and before we log an event, we want to make sure that we preview what exactly the expectations are. So in other words, every time you start a class, you need to preview the expectations. So keep a clean and safe environment, be respectful of others. So in other words, we have these broad expectations that we constantly remind the students of to keep that at the forefront of what we expect them to do in class. So be very explicit that we want to make sure that we're going to have a great class today and here are our expectations then if you see a student breaking the expectation so if a student is talking while you're talking instead of yelling at that kid or sending that kid out of class you simply warn the kid in a positive way remember the expectation was that we are respectful of others at all time when you're talking when i'm talking that's not being respectful of the speaker so you kind of give them a little warning that you know if you do that again i'm going to have to record this in behavior flip or whatever your student behavior system is if the kid continues to do that in a lot of classrooms what happens is if you do that again i'm going to really do it this time and then after the fifth time of saying some kind of empty threat or empty warning you don't do it the kid loses complete respect for you and the classroom environment so what i recommend is you give a preview you warn the kid then you actually follow through with the consequence so if the consequence is i'm going to log this into behavior flip then do it a lot of people don't actually do it. Or if you say, I'm going to call mom, you need to actually call mom and follow through with what it was you were going to say or what you were going to do. You know, I knew somebody when my children were young and their children were young and they would say, you have to do this by the time I count to three. So they would misbehave until they got to the number three. And you're just like, OK, um, let's get rid of the counting and just have them not do this behavior. Exactly. And kids pick up on that, too. And they don't take you seriously. And it's to have a classroom of respect and to have a classroom of high expectations. It's not to have a classroom where all the kids are being compliant. It's to have a classroom where everyone's contributing towards that positive classroom environment. And when a student breaks that norm, it's something that actually needs to be dealt with. Absolutely. So, Nathan, what about consequences? Yeah. So when we're giving out a consequence, after we seek to understand that behavior, we want to hit on two different aspects. We want that consequence to be logical. So we want that to focus on what the behavior was. So if a student gets in trouble in the classroom for throwing something, does it really make sense for them to have a consequence of being kicked out of that classroom? Because that might have been what they were trying to do. So a logical consequence really pairs with what they did. So if they were throwing something in the classroom, maybe they can stay after class and you know clean up that classroom. We also want that to be restorative. So when harm is caused, we want them to be able to repair that harm. They obviously can't go back in time and you know take away what their actions are, but they can try to find a way of who did I affect by throwing something in that classroom? Why? I affected the teacher. I affected the other students in that classroom. I affected my progress academically. And how can they repair the harm with all of those different stakeholders? So that consequence really has to repair the harm for those stakeholders and be logical. And when we pair both of those together with some of those techniques that we highlight in the book, we see that those behaviors start to change. So give me some examples of that. So let's say that a student goes into a classroom and they act out in the classroom. They curse, you know, in that classroom. What ends up happening is you want to address that behavior quickly. So then with the consequence, what you could do is you could um, have them stand up to the class and talk about how their actions affected everyone else in that classroom. They can also come up with a way to repair the harm with that teacher maybe write them a letter of apology, stay after class and talk to them about how those actions affect everyone else, as well as owning that up with their parents or their guardians. And something like code switching, where you talk like this with your friends outside of school, which is fine, but you need to code switch when you're in school or when you're in a professional environment. This is how we talk here versus uh, when you're with your friends outside of school. So kind of getting them to understand that thing, to understand that there is a difference in how you act according to the space that you're in. That is so important. You know, I, tell, I always tell my students, you're a professional student and that's how we behave at school. We behave as professionals. You know, for example, if I do have a student who disrupts class or misbehaves and I'll say, you know what, you disrupt a class for, you know, let's say five minutes. So the best thing to do to make up that time with me is I'll see you for five minutes during break or five minutes before school or five minutes after school. And 
you know, before um, we went and started recording, Nathan, you gave an example of misbehavior in the lunchroom. Could you give us that example, too? Because I think it just really crystallizes what you're talking about here. Yeah. So let's say that you have a group of students in the lunchroom and one of the students starts to throw food in that lunchroom. You know, and that's that's something that's affecting the rest of the people in the lunchroom, as well as whoever's teaching in that lunchroom. And so a good way for them to repair the harm with that lunchroom would be to stay after lunch and clean up the entire cafeteria. What that does is that builds empathy for the custodian that normally has to clean that lunchroom. And it understands that, hey, when I throw food, it might affect other people and it might be silly behavior, but it also creates this atmosphere of, you know, someone else has to do some more work. And when you put them in a consequence where they have to repair that harm with cleaning up that food, you know, they start building empathy for the custodians. And then they understand that, hey, this is my environment. This is my culture. And I need to be careful with my actions. Okay. So we've got a lot of different principles here. The book is Hacking School Discipline Nine Ways to Create a Culture of Empathy and Responsibility Using Restorative Justice by Brad Weinstein and Nathan Maynard. And pick up the book. They've got lots of great suggestions for all of us. Thank you, gentlemen. All right. Thank you. So today I want to tell you about the Advancement Courses Spring Sale. You can save 20% off each course with the code COOL20. So that's just $120 per graduate credit hour or $160 for 50 clock hours. Advancement Courses has over 250 online graduate level PD courses in 19 different subject areas. They have standard content areas like math, science, and social studies but also have courses that are a little hard to find like PE or the arts, counseling, teacher wellness, social emotional learning, and special education courses. And they've even got a new course on maker spaces in the school library. All of these courses are online and self-paced and you have up to six months to complete them. Graduate credit is available with an official transcript from your CAEP and regionally accredited university partners. So to take advantage of the spring sale, go to advancementcourses.com forward slash CoolCat. And remember, use the code COOL20 to get your special 10 minute teacher discount and save 20%. Thank you for listening to the 10 Minute Teacher Podcast. You can download the show notes and see the archive at coolcatteacher.com forward slash podcast. Never stop learning.